There you go. Uh, so I'm currently looking at innovation and change management within uh, IBL uh, in the technology and transformation department. And what we are going to talk about mainly today is going to be about uh, a number of things. We are going to um, discuss the relationship between innovation and design thinking outside the context. Then I'll go into uh, explaining to you the whole process of the design thinking approach or methodology, which spans over three broad uh, stages, inspiration, ideation, and testing. And uh, while going through those different stages, I will be at different point in times, uh, pointing to the tools and techniques that are being used at those stages. And also I will talk about the common challenges and how to overcome them. Uh, again during those stages. So it would be not kind of a linear presentation. I will jump on and off into different kind of aspects uh, as I go through the process. So <clears throat> let's start. First of all, um, what I'm going to present now is a model that uh, comes from uh, Alex Osterwalder, who is the author and the, one of the co-founders of Strategizer. If you, are, you have an opportunity, uh, do spend some time uh, to look for this person. So what Alex uh, uh, did in his latest book, The Invincible Company, uh, what he says is that any corporate or major organizations that you may have started at one point in time with an idea. And this idea, slowly uh, the person, the individual, the entrepreneur, or the group of uh, people who had this idea have been testing this idea. So they tried different markets, they tried different uh, amendments to the product or service. And after a long search, finally they come up to a point where they finally get a, um, a market uh, so they can sell their product or service. So now they have a stable business. And from this point onwards, what happens is there is another stage where they seek to grow the business. And this is the scaling stage where you take it from the small business or medium business and you bring it to a bigger organization or corporate. When you do this, there are, there's one thing that happens that is very interesting. You have to change your focus. Uh, in terms of, if you're running a corporate, you have to be more careful in terms of your logistics, the way you are going to manage your deliveries and your supply chain. It's, it's not the same thing as, as uh, uh, operating in a small business. So those two stages, um, Alex uh, typically refers to them as the exploration phase and then the exploitation phase. The exploitation phase being the phase where you currently are managing the operations and the exploration phase is the phase where you are searching and refining your idea. What is interesting to note is that the skills that is required for the exploitation phase is different from the skills that are required in the exploration phase. Let's dig a little further into this. <clears throat> so as I said before, uh, the whole process of the exploration is quite messy. Uh, it's not a, it's something that is uh, really linear. So the fo focus there is trying to find a stability and reliability in terms of, of your idea. And then in the second uh, stage, which is exploitation, what you are trying to do is to maximize your return while minimizing the risk that are associated. Unfortunately, what happens today is that in situations such as the COVID specifically, you will find that the risk is higher and your returns are diminished. So you are in at the exploitation phase, but you are facing many risks. Now, what happens is very interesting is that when you face this situation, this is when many organizations want to innovate. They say that, okay, Let's try to uh, find new avenues of revenue. But as I told you earlier, the skills required for this is the other skills that were uh, existing during the exploration phase. So many of those organizations have lost this skill or have lost people with those competencies. And this is the real issue today, is that to find really a method within bigger corporate organizations to be able to manage this risk and to find new avenues of development. So um, there are three types of innovations that normally happen within uh, an organization. When you are in the exploitation phase, you will often find that 
you have one type of innovation called efficiency innovation. Uh, for example, you can have uh, products that, or a process that you want to make uh, more effective by optimizing it. You have sustaining innovation in terms of uh, trying to um, extend the life cycle of a product. And then in the exploration phase, you have transformative innovation because there you are really trying to find new avenues to get revenue. Now, uh, let me give you three examples of these so that uh, it's well illustrated. Uh, let's take the case of Amazon. Um, when we talk about Amazon and the fact that they are automating their warehouse and using maybe uh, technologies such as robotics to quickly sort out their different, uh, I would say, packages within warehouses, this is an example of efficiency for innovation. So they're already having an operation that is ongoing. They are trying to be more efficient. The second aspect uh, is sustaining innovation. So when we think about the creation of Kindle and the fact that they have enabled many people to get access to books while in a digital format without having to wait for it to be shipped, this is an example of how they did sustaining innovation. So they recreated the way they are doing the service of product. And the, in terms of transformative innovation, think about what they did in terms of Amazon Web Services. So it's, it's completely uh, different from their traditional business, they found a new way of doing service. So these are, uh, I would say, the very concrete and practical way to explain those type of innovation. Now, you would agree with me that in situations such as the COVID, efficiency innovation uh, does not really help. I take an example. Let's say we are in hospitality industry. You are uh, disrupted by this situation. If you keep on doing efficiency innovation, all that will happen is that you will die more efficient, um, unfortunately. So you can try sustaining innovation, but then it's not enough. What's really required in those uh, really difficult situations are transformative innovation, because you need to find new avenues for revenue and new business models. So there we are with the, those three types of innovation. So, when you are trying to do transformative innovation, as I explained previously, one of the things that happen is that you will try to reduce the uncertainty and risk of your ideas while progressing and trying to find a stability and some reliability in terms of a market. So the best way to do that is to ask for um, feedback from your customers and stakeholders. And while asking for this feedback, then you can reduce this uncertainty and risk. And the best method for reducing this uncertainty and risk is design thinking. So design thinking is actually one method which is extremely user-centric because it focuses on humans and it tries to make sure that the idea that you're bringing really responds to people's needs first before everything else. So this is the whole idea of design thinking and it, where it can be used in the context of innovation. Now, let's dig further into design thinking and see uh, what are the key elements and what are the key states. So uh, this is from IDEO, uh, the model that I'm going to present. If you have the opportunity, again, uh, try to look for it on the internet. So think about it. Whenever you have a problem or an idea uh, you want to develop or a problem you want to solve, there are two things that you would normally do. You would try to see if this uh, idea is feasible. When I say feasible, not only technologically, but also in terms of resources. The question you will ask yourself, can it be made? Second thing you will ask yourself, will it make money? Is it viable? But you will agree with me that those two items are not really guarantees that your project or your idea would be successful. What is important to understand is that Design thinking teaches us to enter through the gate of desirability first. Do users really want the idea or the product or the service you are trying to bring to the market? Only then have you ascertained, when you have ascertained that you are, there's a need for the idea or for the product or for the service that you are bringing to the market, then through successive iterative uh, steps, you can test for feasibility and you can test for viability. So this is the whole concept of the, uh, design thinking. Um, many, time, 
many times back in the past, when you would be an entrepreneur, you will go to the bank and you would ask for a loan, for example. One of the first things that they will ask you is a business plan. What you need to understand today is that in the modern world where you have uh, VCs, when you have uh, incubators and accelerators, what really those people are trying to do is to look for those three different aspects. Uh, first, before going into the very uh, detail of things, they need to be quick into assessing whether your business or your idea is worth it. Uh, if you have the opportunity to look at uh, series such as Dragon's Den or Shark Tank or the French version, Qui peut être mon associé, you will find those panel of investors who are there they will all try uh, to um, judge or to deem the uh, value of the business based on those different aspects. So this is the, I would say, foundation uh, behind the company. Now let's look at the different stages, uh, really. In terms of stages, you have, I told you already, you have the inspiration phase, you have the ideation phase, and you have the prototyping phase. Each one of them, you can break them further down into Inside, asking the right question, brainstorming, idea selection, prototyping, and feedback. So let's go through each one of them, and I'll explain to you what are the tools and techniques which you can use at each stage. So first one is, how do we gather inspiration? Now, uh, there are three techniques uh, or tools that you can use. You can use empathy interviews, observations, and journey maps. Um, let's talk about empathy interviews. So now we are at a stage where we are trying to ascertain what is the kind of problem we are trying to, to address, what are the pain points that are there, and what kind of idea, product, or service will uh, be able to come to the market, will be able to offer to address those pain points and problems. We'll ascertain the needs of people. By using empathy interviews, you do something beyond the traditional survey. What you are trying to do is that you are trying to have a deep connection and understand the experience of the person uh, and the potential customer of your product or service. Now, compared to traditional surveys, you can still do it. Uh, there are two advantages to it. By doing one-to-one -one interviews where you really connect with the person and understand his feelings and go just beyond a simple list of questions, there are two things that happen. Firstly, uh, you are able to probe for additional information because remember, this is a two-way communication instead of having the paper being sent or the digital form being sent to the person. And the second thing that it enables you to do is that uh, you are able to, I would say, personalize the insight that you get out of those interviews. Uh, and it can form a competitive advantage for you. If you send out a survey with forms and I would say, uh, even uh, filling in manually papers. Uh, the same thing can be done by your competitors and the same insights can be provided uh, to everyone on the market if you are uh, outsourcing this to a, to a service provider. So this is one of the advantage of uh, doing empathy interviews. So one of the tools is empathy interviews. The second tools is that of observation. Now, let me tell you a small story around that. It's a uh, quite popular one if you are in design thinking. So there was this guy called Doug uh, Diaz, who was an engineer at uh, General Electric. And one day he was sitting in the MRI room along with the technicians, as he usually does. And he was waiting uh, for some uh, interaction with the technician to see how, what are the latest models and the features he could put on his machine. And while he was waiting, he encountered a young girl in the hallway heading towards the scan room with her parents. Well, he, she was clearly terrified with tears running down her face because at the sight of uh, this MRI ma machine, uh, she was very afraid. And um, seeing this, uh, the MRI technician instantly called for an anesthetist um, so that uh, the child could be sedated because they need to be still within the MRI machine. So this really deeply, uh, I would say, touched uh, Doug uh, at that point in time. And he went back to office. He was uh, just out of a design thinking uh, training uh, from Stanford. And he started thinking that, uh, you know what? I've been meeting with uh, technicians all this time. 
where the real people who are using my machines were, were, were actually the patients. And he was really touched by the story of the young girl. So what he did, he redesigned the whole experience of uh, the MRI machine around um, things that could uh, touch the experience of the person when he comes to do an MRI scan. So he devised this uh, uh, model that you can see here. There are many models like this. And one of the models that he devised was a pirate theme where the child will come in and will get a costume of a pirate. Uh, the people around will explain to him or her that, you know what, you're going to live an adventure, you're going to get into, inside a ship, there are going to be pirates around, and then there's a music that plays where you will find yourself in the sea, and they put him inside the machine and they tell the person, you know what, uh, the kid, don't move because the pirates are going to really find you. So you need to stay still. So this is the, the rule of the game. So the uh, scan goes through smoothly. And with this, um, I would say that the fact is that in terms of data, the number of patients needing sedations, especially kids decreased dramatically compared to 80% that was uh, the figures before. So as you can see, uh, design thinking actually aims directly at impacting the experience of people. And this is a very, uh, I would say, practical example of how observation can be used in design thinking. So next uh, one is uh, customer journey maps, which is simply a list of touch points. The touch point is the opportunity a person has in terms of interacting with your brand or service and to make an opinion about your brand or service. So those different touch points, uh, you can map it uh, as you can see, there's a generic one on the screen. Once you map it, you can select for each of these touch points, what are the pain points or the pain areas of your customers. And once you ascertain this, then you can work directly on those pain areas to come up uh, with the design thinking, the rest of the design thinking session. So I uh, presented three different tools which you can use at the first stage. Uh, next one is very important. Uh, it's the concept of extreme users. Again, at the very beginning uh, stages of design thinking. Um, understand that extreme users uh, are important in the sense that there's a saying in design thinking that if you go for average users, you get average solutions. So what we mean by design extreme users are to look for users that are in a particular category. Either they are very familiar with your service or they are very novice. So let me give you one example of this. Xylis, who was a company approach uh, ideal uh, to ask them to uh, review their uh, portfolio of uh, utensils. They do kitchen utensils and gadgets. So what IDEO uh, did, uh, they approach uh, two categories of extreme users. First, they approach children and old ladies, old uh, people who were having issues or were nervous as using, at using kitchen utensils. And drew, with the power of observation, they found out that those children had trouble using, for example, those pizza wheels with the handles because it needed quite an uh, amount of force. So through this, uh, they developed then a pizza wheel where you can see on the right of my screen, where you can apply pressure directly above the blade. So that's one example. And then they studied another category of uh, uh, extreme user, which were cooks, because they uh, use everyday uh, kitchen utensils. And what they found out is that when these uh, people were using whisks, they often find it, uh, found it difficult to clean the bottom portion of the whisk. So they created one whisk which was open at the uh, bottom, as you can see on my screen on the right. So this is the power of uh, using extreme users as reference points for your different uh, design thinking activities at the very start, especially uh, at the very start of the design thinking process. So Xylis went on and developed a couple of other, uh, I would say, um, gadgets and kitchen utensils based on those uh, activities. Now, uh, once we've done with this, uh, I would say, inspiration phase where we found some insight, it's always important now to convert this insight into a question. So asking the right question is uh, something which is very important in design thinking. Uh, so let me tell you a small story around that so that you can understand the power of 
uh, turning the insight into a, either a program statement or a question. So several years back, um, Colgate had a multi-billion business. They were the first one in 1974 to get uh, the deodorant soap Irish Spring on the market. And uh, Procter & Gamble wanted to get into the competition. And so what they did, they uh, put together a team of uh, R&D. And these guys were asked to look for an, uh, a competitive product. And there was a secret rule within uh, Procter & Gamble where they won't put any product on the market unless they've gone through a panel of uh, customers uh, internally. So the R&D team uh, worked on different uh, proposals and six times they failed. So after some time, they decided to bring in uh, a guy called Min Basatria. So Min was actually an uh, industrial engineer and he was passionate about design and was reading books around it. And one of the things, uh, the first thing he did uh, when he joined the team, he told them, look, let's sit down and let's try to frame what is really uh, the problem you're trying to solve. In, let's frame it into a question. Let's ask the question, why? So after several brainstorming sessions, some said that, okay, we are trying to find a soap that uh, is going to uh, make more money. Some tried to say that we are going to uh, try to find uh, an anti-competitive product. But finally, they came up with this question, how might we make a soap a more refreshing soap? So this was the initial question. And when they dig further, they created uh, this soap called Coast, which was very successful. It also made a lot of money for Procter & Gamble. It was later sold up to another company. And the reason why I'm telling you this story is for you to understand the power of the question. The R&D team took eight months and six failures and did not come up with any uh, viable solution. Min Basadria took two hours to come up with a question and then to come up with a solution. So it's very important in design thinking that you uh, frame your insight into a question. And one of the formats is how might we, uh, if ever you are on a design thinking thorough course one day, maybe you will get uh, uh, to get uh, more uh, used to those kind of framing of questions. So uh, we've uh, finished with the inspiration phase. Now we get into the second one, which is the ideation phase. You've uh, done your interviews, you've got your insights, you've uh, have uh, your questions, which is uh, ready. Now you need to find ideas around your, um, your uh, problem statement or your question. So we come to the point of ideation. Now, to ideate, uh, we have to understand something. Um, whenever, uh, as managers or leaders, we are in the business, we have what we call convergent thinking. And this is normal because we have to take decisions uh, on a daily basis. We have a number of choices or options in front of us, and we have to narrow down those choices and uh, come up with a decision uh, for the business. When it comes to innovation, we have to change this mindset slightly. We have to uh, adopt a divergent kind of thinking, which means that we have to consider all options before narrowing it down. So, at this point of ideation, uh, the common tool that we'll use is, of course, uh, brainstorming, uh, which many of you may have used uh, before. But what you need to understand is that brainstorming must not come on its own. You must frame the question. There must be a focus on which you are going to brainstorm, and there must be a number of rules on which you are going to brainstorm. And while you are brainstorming, it's important that you go for quantity, not for quality initially. You must go for crazy ideas and you must not put some barriers to the way you are going to think. Later on, you are going to do a filtering process uh, to be able to pull out those ideas that are really meaningful. And we'll talk about this a bit later. So the power of brainstorming, let me tell you another story. So it was the Pacific Northwest Power Company. Uh, so they had issues. They were in a very poor region. They were operating power lines, uh, distribution lines, and they had issues with ice accumulating over power lines. 
So they could not find or figure out what they would do to clear out the ice of those power lines in remote areas, especially. So they had a brainstorming session where all kinds of crazy ideas started to come in, where one participant suggested that they train uh, wild bears to climb on the poles and shake the ice off. And another person said, uh, you know what, uh, instead of training them, why don't we put a honeypot at the middle of the uh, power line and uh, lure the, the bears to come onto those power lines. And then another guy said, uh, you know what, to put those honey pots there, let's have an helicopter to put it there. And all of a sudden, it occurred to them that actually, while using a helicopter, the downward drift of the uh, helicopter would actually be enough to uh, shed away all the ice that was on the power lines. So you can see here that the contribution of all those crazy ideas, even if they did not make sense at the very beginning, they contribute to actually build up into a very valid idea that was actually adopted in real life by those uh, power companies. So this is the power of uh, brainstorming. Today you have a number of tools. You can use, it, uh, I would say, sticky notes uh, directly on a board uh, to run brainstorming sessions. But you have also uh, virtual uh, software uh, that you can use, like Mural or Miro, uh, for running brainstorming sessions. So we talk about ideation. Now we have a list of ideas. The next step is, of course, to select which is the right idea. And you all agree with me when it's on uh, Christmas Eve or we are at uh, New Year, the most difficult part is to select which chocolate we are going to select from what we have in front of us. So it's a bit like this when you have uh, to do the idea section. You have a lot of ideas. How do you select the idea? Well, there are many ways to do that. Uh, there are many tools and techniques that are available. Even those that I'm showing you today are not I would say uh, the only ones uh, through your research, you can find other uh, tools and techniques. I'm showing you some of the generic ones. Um, one of the ways which I think uh, works well is when you work on your list of ideas, uh, I refer to uh, very often to Eric Rice with the author of Lean Startup or the Startup Way. Um, what Eric says is that whenever you choose an idea, um, any modern company does two things. One of the uh, things they do is that they have to make products and deliver services which are reliable and of high quality. The second thing that they do is that they have to create and discover new products and ideas. When you go through your list of ideas, you will often found, find that they will fit in, in those two categories. On one hand, you will find that there are ideas which are aiming directly at your core system or existing processors in terms of improvements. And on the other hand, you will have the, a list of ideas that are innovative and creative. Now, uh, let me give you an example of this. Uh, if you have ideas where you see you need a particular line of business application or an ERP, or even um, you need to manage your customer database, you need for example, a CRM solution, that will fall on the left-hand side. So from this point onwards, you don't need to use design thinking for the rest of the process. Because it's very important, we were talking about the challenges uh, you will have in design thinking. One of the challenges is to actually know uh, when to use the traditional way of uh, managing ideas into a traditional project management methodology. You don't need to reinvent the wheel to install a line of business applications or ERP or CRM, for example. Just, uh, you just have to take it to another platform, another way of managing. However, if you have innovative, creative ideas that have never been tried before, from there on, continue into your design thinking process because this uh, process is actually very much applicable uh, to the rest. Now, it is not to say that you can't use design thinking for more, I would say, uh, improvement ideas. Uh, I've done it in the past uh, in, in organizations, but uh, it's not particularly as powerful as you would uh, use it in terms of innovation and creation uh, of ideas. 
Another way to select your ideas is to have all your participants uh, group those ideas into different clusters on your board, and then you ask each one of them to cast three votes uh, on three different ideas. And the ideas that get the most votes, then you can go for it uh, specifically. So this is how you can uh, manage your idea selection. Once you have managed your idea selection, you've selected, okay, I'm going for this idea in particular. Now I'm going to do the prototyping. So why do we do prototyping? Uh, Tom Kelly from IDEO uh, often said that you need to fail often so that you can succeed sooner. Uh, there's a saying in design thinking uh, that goes like this. Uh, traditional thinkers think to build and creative thinkers build to think. What we mean by that is that it's only by doing the actual thing uh, that we are able really to see uh, the pros and cons of the idea. And it's specifically very important when you're trying something new because you don't have any reference point in the past to look at and to know what will happen. You need to try it out. But trying it out, you need to try out with cheap and fast uh, kind of prototypes. You can't go for multi-million kind of investments uh, if you are not sure that this thing is going to, to be successful or not. So this is one of the, I would say, key uh, found foundation of uh, design thinking. Uh, if we look at Bosch, for example, in terms of their innovation uh, plan or program within the organization, they created some uh, a kind of innovation funnel where they start up uh, with uh, gathering ideas, uh, let's say around 200, and then they kill about 70% of them. So you see it goes like into a funnel. 60% of them, they, go, they try it out on the market, uh, they test it out, and then they retain only 15%, uh, 15 of them, that will go into the exploitation phase. So as you can see, uh, these uh, are being adopted because they go for a lot of ideas, they test it, and then only a few go for the exploitation. Now, you don't need to go for 200 ideas uh, to the scale of the companies we have locally. You can do go for 20 or 30 ideas, but it's very important that you have this portfolio of products, uh, not products, this portfolio of ideas that you test constantly if you want to have a valid innovation program within your organization. Uh, so that's about it. Um, so we've talked about prototypes, and examples of it also are digital prototypes, uh, which you will find. Um, when, for example, you're trying to do mobile apps where you can have also wireframes, which are dummy kind of uh, uh, prototypes. Um, Eric Rice, again, advocates the use of MVPs, uh, minimum viable products, uh, when you want to test your product with customers on the market. But you can have also physical prototypes or experienced prototypes. So, we talk about prototypes and the importance of it, but once you do the prototype, you need to gather the feedback about it. Is it uh, what, what people think about it? And uh, here you need to understand that uh, prototyping uh, and this whole process of design thinking is not a linear process. It's an iterative process. So that when you do the feedback, it needs to feed the, uh, what, the comments of the of your customers back to the prototyping phase so that you can improve or uh, change uh, what you're trying to do in terms of idea. So the process will be similar to what you are seeing on your screen. Uh, once you have the idea, you will prototype it, you will test it, and based on the feedback, maybe you will rework on your idea and you will have a new prototype, a second version, a third version, until you come up with a prototype that really works on the market. And there's a really, a, I would say, a demand uh, or a request for it. Now, one of the tools that you will see is available for prototyping is the feedback grid. Now, why do we use the feedback grid? You will see that it's very, I would say, positive in terms of uh, approach. Uh, we don't try to break the idea of the person. Uh, if I refer to Amazon again, Jeff Bezos had this um, rule internally. Whenever someone would come to him and would ask about a decision for an idea that they have, 
he would say that there are two kinds of decisions, uh, two types of decisions. Type one decisions, which are major, big, that could have catastrophic implications, and type two decisions that are minor initiatives with minor impact, uh, impact uh, within the organization. Now, startups, because they have uh, they are low in terms of resources, they treat many decisions as type two decisions. So, so they don't invest a lot of resources or money, they test it on the move. Okay. Bigger organizations uh, would uh, be able to take type one decisions. The problem is that when you move into the exploitation phase, uh, leaders tend to take all decisions as type one decisions. So they consider all even minor initiatives as being uh, quite impactful on them. So what Jeff Bezos said that you need to give a small yes to those ideas when they progress along uh, the, the organization so that they give, you give them a chance to really um, make it their way within the innovation funnel. So uh, coming back to the feedback grid, you will see that when we have an idea and we have tested it, what we'll ask is what worked, what could be improved, any question that we have, and any ideas. We don't say that, okay, you know, I don't like this idea, it's not going to work. No, we are positive about it and we give suggestions. And through these different feedback and suggestions, of course, you will look at the aspects that won't really work, but you will help the idea either to get improved into something else or to be pivoted into something completely different. So uh, that's about it. We covered, I think, all the different stages. First, we talk about the inspiration phase where we had to do the interviews or observations to get the insights. Secondly, we talk about how once we get the insights, we create a question around it or a problem statement. From there, we went into the brainstorming sessions uh, where we took this problem statement or question and we came up with a lot of ideas through divergent thinking. Then we uh, selected the idea. After selection, we went into the prototyping and feedback phase where we use cheap prototypes to de-risk the uh, initiative or project that we are trying to do. And then through cheap and fast prototypes, we are able to progress along the way and then come up with a uh, final idea that truly works. So this is the whole process of design thinking.